Hey everyone, Sleepy Reader here with a bit of a back issue haul. I went to a Rose City Comic Con now two weekends ago, and I didn't get very many comic books there, but I did get a few. And then this past weekend, there was a 50% off sale at one of the bigger shops here in Portland, Oregon, um, called Cosmic Monkey. <clears throat> and I got, I got picked up some books there. So I thought I'd show you the two combined. Here's the um, little stack. Actually, there's one more comic here that I couldn't find that I bought for me and my daughter to read, and I must have maybe left it in her room, and she's in, in bed by now. But um, anyway, I there was uh, a shop that, that sells at um, Rose City Comic Con that has a whole section of their comics that they sell for 50% off, but at... Um, and so the the uh, sticker price is a little high because um, they always sell them at sixty percent off, fifty percent off. But at Rose City Comic Con, they have this big section of seventy percent off the sticker price, and uh, it's always very crowded around there. And I just went there on the on the Sunday, hoping the crowd would there'd be less of a crowd. It was still a little hard to look at all the books, all the boxes, and uh, and I was running out of time, so I just grabbed a few things that I wanted, and. Um, to some degree, because I was rushed, maybe made a mistake or two. Because I actually got, <laughs> I actually bought a duplicate of one of these, but I only have, I don't didn't put the duplicate in the pile. But um, I was just moving so quickly and trying to sort through comics really rapidly that I made some mistakes. But anyway, um, very happy to get this uh, Thor 173. Um, still during the Jack Kirby run, and I believe. Um, inked by Bill Everett. And uh, and this one is definitely inked by Bill Everett. Uh, this is Thor 174, the next issue. And this is unusual. On the cover, it's signed Kirby Everett. And you just don't normally see Kirby's signature on covers, especially from the, uh, the late Silver Age or the early Bronze Age. Um, I wonder if Bill Everett put both their signatures there. Let's see. I'm going to double check and see if, if Bill Everett, I'm going to open this one up, see if Bill Everett was the inker on here. The reason why I take an interest is I think Bill Everett was kind of a stealth, super great inker on Jack Kirby. Yep, this is a Bill Everett inked one. Um, before Mike Royer got his shot at, at Kirby, I think Everett came very close to sort of capturing the greatness that was in the pencils of Kirby. He maybe added a little more cross-hatching lines here and there. Um, but so I, in particular, want to own all the Bill Everett inked Kirby. Let me show you this one, too. I assume this will be Everett also. The tape will let me open it. Um, and Bill Everett, I assume it's the same Bill Everett who created the Submariner and did do art for... At, on and off during the Silver Age, Silver Age um, Marvel, although not a whole lot. Um, but this is another issue uh, inked by him. And he just, he does a really good job of capturing, and perhaps enhancing, but definitely capturing the power of Kirby's inks far beyond what, um, what the much maligned um, Vinnie Coletta would do with Kirby's ink, Kirby's pencils, and Coletta was the uh, the inker, the main inker on most of Thor. So to me, it's a delight when I can find the ones inked by Bill Everett. And then I'm also very interested in the early um, John Buscema run on Thor, back when, especially when Stan Lee was still the writer on it. Um, the fifteen cent issues is the way I think of it as. Um, so I want to get all of the Buscema 15 cent issues. This is number 189. If you saw my haul from Maine, you saw that I got quite a few Thor issues there. Now this is one of my, a bit of a mistake. I think it, I probably thought it said $20 here. The sticker price is actually 28. Um, now 70% off of 28, that's a little... It probably what cost me eight dollars or so, um, eight fifty. 
which really isn't that bad, but uh, but I thought I was getting more bargain prices. Most of the comics I bought were sticker priced fifteen or sixteen dollars, so that they were about you know four fifty or so. <clears throat> this one sticker priced anything sticker priced from these boxes ten dollars or below was one dollar. So I got this kind of beaten up copy of the Viking Prince. Uh, I. Uh, I don't know for sure, but I, I wouldn't be surprised if this a lot of this is reprints. I haven't looked inside here. Great Kaluta cover. Um, so it's I'm really happy to have it as a reader copy of Viking Prince and also, I guess, some other kind of medieval heroes. Um, and then speaking of Kubert, here is a DC special presents Enemy Ace. And again, I'm not sure if this is reprints or the... The originals um, but I love this cover and the way the color is done on is pretty awesome too um, battle for survival in the fiery skies of World War one um, enemy ace is kind of one of those cult classic uh, comics I don't know how many actual issues of enemy ace there were out there um, but yeah they focused on a a German I don't a German um, Flying Ace in World War One. I. I don't know if it was um, if it was supposed to be the Red Baron or anything like that. It's been a, a long. I remember reading some Enemy Ace back when I was a kid, but I don't think I've read any since. Okay, and then um, I so that was that was the few I got at Rose City, and then there was the sale at Cosmic Monkey, who. Um, so it's 50% off the sticker prices, uh, and some of them are really good deals, and some of them still aren't good deals, uh, even at 50% off. Uh, I feel like Cosmic Monkey's prices haven't caught up with reality, <laughs> the reality of the modern market. But anyway, they still have a lot of great stuff there, and it's a, it's a great store, and the people who run it are really nice. Um, I picked this one up. I always want to get more... Um, Trimpy Hulk. They didn't have, uh, you know, Herb, Herb Trimpy era Hulk, particularly the earlier Herb Trimpy Hulk. This is maybe in the middle of his run. But anyway, what caught my attention here was, um, what's his name? Is it Tiger Shark? No, it's, uh, uh. We, anyway, just recently in, uh, I think it was in, in Shannon's videos, he was discussing how this guy had a really cool costume. And I was like, yeah, I agree. I always thought that was a really cool costume. Tiger Shark, it says right on the cover. I'm, I'm an idiot. Um, and this is kind of a cool cover. So there were a few Incredible Hulks there I wanted. The prices were okay. Um, I decided to pick this one with Tiger Shark on the cover. I don't think I ever read that as a kid um, or as an adult. So I thought it would be fun to take a shot at that. And here's one that I want to get when I can get readers' copies of it. Uh, they're, they're nice... This is issue number one, and they um, has a, some chips in it. The cover looks a little faded. And unfortunately, maybe it turned out to be a mistake to get this copy. Although I don't know if even a more expensive copy, since often it's just done by, by the raw condition of things, would have been any better. But when I open this one up, there are several pages in here. I don't know if I can find them that are misprinted in some way so that they're all a blur. First I thought it was just like some weird aging thing, but um, but there's some pages that are just something went really wrong with the printing, and, and then the rest of it's pretty readable. But the painful thing is the, the misprinting occurs in a Bernie Ryston story here. I don't know, can you see that? There's just, it's it's, like it blurs right in front of your eyes. Um, and this page gets better. But that first page, ugh. It's really hard to, to read, to parse out the visuals there. I don't know if it's going to come out in here in my crappily shot video. So there's a few pages, maybe four pages throughout the comic that are just blurred, painfully blurred. Um, but anyway, I click pop, plop when I can find it cheaply, readers' copies. Um, 
They had other copies, not of issue number one, but of later issues, each of which I think had a, you know, eighteen or nineteen dollar sticker price or twenty dollar sticker price. So it would have been ten dollars a piece for me, and I was not quite up for that. <clears throat> And then I bought two more issues of Kill Raven. Again, if you've watched some of my recent haul videos, you can see me collecting the Amazing Adventures featuring the War of the Worlds, and then they change it to Kill Raven, Warrior of the Worlds. So I got number 32 and number 31. Um, and I think I just have two left in this whole run. The very first issue, which will probably be the, the hard one to get while being cheap, and uh, and just one of the issues near the end of the run. Um, these are these are uh, P. Craig Russell, of course. And during the period where, as I told my daughter, the writer um, McGregor, um, Don McGregor, went a little crazy, a little batshit insane with the amount of text he put on each and every page. Uh, it was an ordeal for me as a kid to read these. Um, now I'm sort of curious to try reading it again. As I thought it was horrible stuff. I mean, I thought it was the worst of overwriting when I was 12 or 14 or whenever these came out. Um, I wonder if I'll feel the same. The art is amazing. And I, as I remember... Russell was was expanding and uh, experimenting more with every issue. Um, so there's some amazing art, and look at all that text they expect you to read. <clears throat> it probably was the kind of thing where I just gave up on reading the captions and only read the dialogue, but even the dialogue is kind of overpopulated with words at points. Um, so yeah, crazy times for Don McGregor. I know he has he has his enthusiasts, the people who think he's he was a really great writer of the era. Maybe I'll change my mind when I reread it as an adult. I don't know if I've read any Don McGregor yet, you know, in my uh, in my later years here. Then I grabbed Satana. I always liked the uh, horror titles and never quite got enough of them as a kid. Never read Satana before. I don't know how many how many uh, Marvel comics she appeared in. I have a feeling she appeared in a few black and white comics also. This one is written by Chris Claremont, so that's very promising. And the art is by The Tribe. And my understanding is The Tribe was a whole group of uh, artists working in the Philippines. Um, so probably Tony DeZunia and... Nesta Redondo and all of those people. I don't know for sure. It seems like I think Tony Dezunia might have been the leader of the tribe. Uh, the way, the way um, uh, Neil Adams was the leader of Krusty Bunkers. I think he was the leader. Or was there another, another group that would group ink things under um, Neil Adams' guy, uh, under Neil Adams' uh, guidance? Um, so anyway, I'm curious about this. Her name is. Satana Hellstrom. She's basically the, the sister of the son of Satan. She's the daughter of Satan. And I guess Satan decided to name her after himself, so he named her Satana. And then I got another issue of Marvel Spotlight, Son of Satan. Um, I, I can't remember what issue it started with, like 12 or 11 or 13. I have the... This continues my... Son of Satan collection, let's say. Um, I think this might be like the fifth issue in the uh, Son of Satan run, or fourth or fifth, um, and I have the ones before it. This one's in pretty beat up shape. It only, with a half price, only cost me $2. I, I was about to buy a whole bunch more Marvel Spotlight Son of Satan, but I, I just pulled myself back. I felt like maybe I was buying too many comics. This one has art by Jim Mooney and script by Steve Gerber. Um, it's always fun to stumble upon some Steve Gerber you didn't know about. And Jim Mooney is, to my mind, a very solid, unflashy um, car uh, creator or artist of the um, 60s and 70s. So um, 
it it never wows you just looking at it, but I always know I'll have a good read when Jim Mooney is the is the penciler. It's good good solid storyteller. And then this was the the main feature for me for this particular shopping trip was getting a bunch of the losers. And these are all ones that have Jack Kirby interiors, even though only some of the covers um, feature Jack Kirby. This one, for instance, does not. I'm not even sure who the artist is here. It might be Kubert. I'm not. Oh, yeah, it is Kubert. There's the signature up there, Joe Kubert. Uh, it's not really one of Kubert's best. It's, it's an interesting angle on things, but um, I love the way they did the lettering on these war covers somehow with this extra big letter. Nobody around to stop us on this mission, guys. Once we cross this bridge, we're in, Storm. But, um, yeah, so on the inside, so what my understanding is I, I believe that Kirby drew issues um, 151 through 162. I'm not sure maybe he drew issue 150 also, but I think it's just those 11 issues. Um, and... He was inked by Bruce D. Barry, who wasn't, to my mind, as... There was something missing from Barry compared to uh, compared to Mike Royer, but it still was very good inking, still captured, kept the power of the Kirby, the Kirby artwork. Um, and although Kirby was pretty much just doing time at DC because he knew he was leaving and going back to Marvel, he still did a marvelous job on these comics, and I'm, I'm really glad to get some of them. So I got that one. <clears throat> that was 151. And this is the most beat up copy. Um, cost me two dollars, but it has this chip in the, or rip in the cover. And then I got um, 154, which does have a Kirby cover. Nice one. And I got 155. And. Uh, And let's let's be clear, the Nazis are the bad guys, totally. <laughs> um, 156. 150, 160, another Joe Kubert cover. Um, another odd-looking Joe Kubert cover. I, not to me, Joe Kubert at his best, although... Certainly not at his work, or you know, certainly better than lots of covers. But maybe partially it's the colors. But it seems like he went. I I'd love to get a lot of Joe Kubert um, war covers and analyze them. Maybe he he liked to go for all kinds of weird angles, and it was kind of disturbing. Maybe the capturing the uh, disturbing aspects of war. I don't know. Did Kubert fight in the war? I mean, Kirby is well known to have fought in the front lines in France um, to have been a scout, so gone beyond the front lines to draw where the enemy was and bring it back to his commanders. And so finally I've got uh, issue 162, which I believe is Kirby's last issue. The cover is not by Kirby. I don't know who this cover is by. It's pretty good. If I had to take a wild guess, I'd say maybe it was Ernie Colon. Um... Maybe the, the color palette in war comics of the time is, is just a lot of greens and grays, right? Um, which made sense, but maybe made for a less exciting cover. But um, our replacements, they're just kids. So I am eager to read these. <clears throat> And then while I was at it, because I don't have all of Jimmy Olsen's run by Jack Kirby, I looked there and I did not find ones that I didn't have or maybe one or two at prices I didn't want to pay. But I just decided to pick up some other Jimmy Olsen that was affordable. This looks like a, it's kind of a beat up cover or a little bit beat up, but it looks like a uh, Neil Adams cover featuring Hippie Olsen's Hate Inn. Superman is a freak out. We hate money. We hate Superman. <laughs> so I just had to get that. 
And then I love collections of, these are, every once in a while I come across these reprints of just crazy Jimmy Olsen covers. So the idea, the concept behind this uh, giant size one is that it is all uh, Jimmy Olsen's dating experiences. <laughs> Looking through your little black book, eh, Jimmy, says Superman. I almost wonder if that, who drew that Superman there, Superman and Jimmy. It almost, I don't know. It almost looks like Gil Kane to me, but that's probably my imagination. <clears throat> Gil Kane inked by someone else, but. So, yeah, we're going to get all kinds of weird dating experiences of Jimmy Olsen with a werewolf, as a werewolf, with a 308-pound 300, uh, woman. Um, something that's probably more common these days than it was back in the 1950s or early 60s. Um, and Miss Gizblizzniz, um, who changed him into a human porcupine. I assume she's going to be kind of like Mr. Ms. Pitslick. Um, so anyway, looking forward to digging into that. And then also kind of in the same vein, I like, I get a kick out of Superman family comics. I'm actually hoping these are reprints of older work. Um... It looks like they're from sometime in the 70s. So this is 172. This suit, so a giant, giant size Superman family. Dollar comics, 80 pages, all new stories. And that looks like a Neil Adams cover. In fact, there's a Neil Adams uh, signature there. Um, so this will be new stories from the late 70s or early 80s, I think. And then, oh, from a bit of our earlier period, I should have shown this before that one, is uh, Superman Family Giant, Supergirl Presents Superman Family Giant. I wonder if this is around the time when the Supergirl movie is coming out, although, judging by the 50 cent price, I might be off on that. Um, so I assume this may be a reprint kind of thing. It was only $4, so $2 when I paid it with the half price. Um... So looking forward to digging into those two. And then finally, I got two, um, just two because most of, most of their, um, just two black and white comics from the 70s, black and white comic magazines from the 70s from Marvel, because most of their prices uh, were just crazy prices, even when you divide them half, like $60 and things like that. Um, so $30 when you divide it in half. But this was one, uh, The Haunt of Horror, Dracula, Zombies, Gilgamesh. And, of course, Lilith, who has this nice skin-tight outfit. Um, so I definitely am looking for any of the old horror ones that I don't already have. So I snatched that up. It cost me three fifty. dollars uh, Seemed like a good price. And for $5, I got... Um, Another Marvel preview, number 19, starring Cull the Destroyer. Um, and this this one, I'm trying to remember, there was something interesting about the artist in here. It was... Um, oh, it was Sal Buscema, inked by Tony DeZunia. And I don't know that I've ever seen Sal Buscema do a Conan or Cull type character before. And, of course, uh, Dezunia's inks cover him up pretty heavily. So um, it's probably more, in some senses, more Dezunia than, than Sal Buscema. But Sal Buscema was a good, solid storyteller. And I'm interested to see how he, his work comes out in one of these barbarian, Hyborian age-type stories. And then at the back was this incredible portfolio of Marie and John Severin um, call drawings. I wonder if this was originally released as one of those portfolios you used to be able to buy out of fanzines. Um, and then they reprinted it here, probably in a smaller size than the originals. So the artists would sell portfolios back then, um, basically sets of prints, I believe. I never owned any. Uh, where they did, you know, what would be their best work or their most detailed work. And you can certainly see how incredibly detailed all of these are. Um, 
makes me hunger for more of uh, Marie and John Severin doing this type of stuff. They just, they were really, really awesome. And at the time, at a certain time, the, their little run on Call was, I think, kind of revered, and that's probably what led to them to doing this portfolio. And then finally, there's a um, a Solomon Kane story, written by Don Glut, who I that name is vaguely familiar. He was around at the time, but then an artist named Will Mignot, Mignot and Steve Gann. Steve Gann, I remember, he was kind of, I don't know, somewhere between Tony DeZunia and, and uh, Ernie Chan style-wise, but I've never heard of the this penciler, I presume penciler Will Mignot, and Don Glut is kind of obscure. I, I feel like I heard someone talking about him on a podcast, and maybe he wrote stories about a, um, you know, a uh, African-American ghetto detective. So maybe Don Glut was an African-American. There were, there were African-Americans sprinkled throughout things in the uh, 70s and early 80s that you never really knew that they were African-American. Um, I never knew Jim Owsley was African-American until recently when learning he's the same as Christopher Priest and, and that Christopher Priest is African-American. So anyway, um, I don't even know if I'm right on that or wrong on that about Glut being African-American. I have to look into it again. Uh, looks like quite a bit of text on these pages, too. I mean, Don McGregor, with his crazy amounts of text, probably didn't seem as bad then as he, he appears now. Um, still, the text is more limited here um, in the writing by Roy Thomas than it was by... <clears throat> by Don McGregor in that Kill Raven stuff. There were so many variations, I guess, on the Barbarian um, back then with Kill Raven and Cull and Conan and Thongor and Claw the Unconquered. And, you know, even when they brought back Hercules in DC, that was kind of a Barbarian kind of thing too, wasn't it? Anyway, I'm, I'm straying as I have no more comics to show you. I will talk to you all later. Bye-bye.